very important concept, okay? I shouldn't say that it's a must, but most of the modern operating system is usually depends on this kind of events to trigger a particular process to run, okay? Uh, I hope that you understand that there is a clock inside a um, hardware or a motherboard. It's just like a hot bit, okay? So it's keep on sending an interrupt signal. Okay, so this is interrupted. Just a half bit. You can treat this as maybe a one, uh, one millisecond, maybe too much, but uh, yeah, let's let's keep the example to be one millisecond. Okay, one millisecond. Uh, then every one millisecond, that this clock interrupt may comes. Okay, to tell the CPU that hey, time's up. One millisecond has passed. What do you want to do? Okay, so it's to tell the kernel because of what's that is because kernel is a all the driver there. The hardware interrupt comes in as always the driver to pick it up, and actually it is the kernel. And the kernel have to decide what should him or her doing. Uh, well, they can do the following, they can ignore it, okay? Or they can handle it, and what is the meaning of handle it? Maybe there is a P1 there executing on the CPU, and the P1 has been running for a long enough time. Okay, so long enough, maybe uh, its quarter is five milliseconds. Okay, after one, two, three, four, five, five hot per signal coming in, then the scheduler decided that, yeah, you should go away. And that is the time that the scheduler step in to choose another process to run. And last time we already talked about it, there is another kind of interruption of a process, another kind of interruption of process, not this first kind. The first kind is when a timer comes in. The scheduler or the kernel or the driver for the clock signal determine what, what to do. And the second is about hardware, hard disk, maybe a keyboard, maybe some other input devices. Usually the input devices comes in with data. Okay? But before you come in with data, you have to ask for it, right? Let's say that you call scan app. You scan you call scan app, then you ask for some data from the keyboard. You do an app open and an app read. Then you ask for the data. So before you can get the data, you ask for it. Usually when you ask for it, the data is not available. Okay? So this you I mean that this is a common sense, right? It's not available. So here I put a hard disk here to represent all kinds of input devices. You wait for the input devices. Then what should you do? You are the process. Okay? So you say that mm, I call scan out. I shouldn't move, okay? I, I don't have any code to run because I'm waiting for the data from the hard disk, waiting for the data from the keyboard. So the scheduler also know about it, right? Because the scheduler, the kernel, the driver are all in one piece, okay? Then what you do? You are the kernel, implement, implementer, the maintainer of the kernel, then you know that, ah, oh, maybe it's time to pick an other process to run. Maybe this guy, okay? So this guy pre-free is not a, a very uh, long-living process, okay? It may die very soon. Maybe it's just uh, running some uh, main and then immediately it's just zero. So within this green range, okay, it dies. Now this is the third kind of, uh, I shouldn't say an interrupt, but the calling of the scheduler. So what is the mean of calling of the scheduler? You remember when you have a process terminated? You will, the LK every memory is associated with that guy. Plus, what is that? What is the memory? The code, the memory, the local variable, the global variable, all gone, okay? So this guy doesn't have any code, it becomes a zombie. Now, whatever is zombie or not, yeah, it's basically don't have any code to run, huh? So you should not keep that guy running on the CPU because you don't have code, all right? So this is the third kind of interrupt, I just say, I just say interrupt, but a third kind of events, okay? That the scheduler will step in. So I color this light blue, light blue, light blue here to represent that, yeah, that's the moment for the kernel or the scheduler to step in to choose an L process to run, okay? And the last guy here is just a, a random selection, okay? Because what maybe the uh, P2 waiting for some input, the input is available, then let's choose P2. This is a random process, or the data is not available at this moment, you can choose P1, okay? P1, because P1 stopped running, it's just because the clock say that, yeah, you have taken all your quota, 
Okay, how about after I move you out, I recharge your quarter, I give you all the quarter then you can continue to run. Maybe it's time for P1 or maybe P2 is just up to the scheduler. Okay? So what is the scheduler? The scheduler is actually uh, just a resource manager. Okay? On one hand, left hand, he has a bunch of processes. Okay? He knows about all the process status. He knows what they are waiting for. What is their uh, let's say time quarter? And on the right hand, this guy is a scheduler as well, okay? Uh, on the right hand is all the devices, all the events that come in. And I know that, oh, there is an event, okay? Uh, which process for that event should, should deliver the data to? You? He knows, okay? And of course, based on those events, I can select a most appropriate guy to run. And the selection process is called scheduling algorithm, okay? So what does the scheduling algorithm there will be a bunch of scheduling algorithm. Some names are very straightforward, some names are very annoying. Okay, scheduling. Yeah, you just choose scheduling algorithm. Okay. So you can uh, see a bunch of uh, scheduling algorithm in a in a Wikipedia. I particularly love this. Uh, no scheduling. Is there any one call? Yeah, I particularly this not love this name. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know why they. I, I know why, of course. Is in it is a uh, introduction to the scheduler. He's already telling. Yeah, there is a such kind of BFS okay, algorithm. Okay, BFS. Yeah, no, it's not prefer search. Huh? Okay, so BFS. Uh, others. Uh, our current. Currently using algorithm is called completely fair scheduler, which is uh, running in your Linux. I don't know for Mac because Mac is not a uh, uh, classified. <coughs> give a name to it to their uh, scheduler. Okay, as you can see, it's a uh, different uh, Linux. Before using completely fair, fair completely fair scheduler, is use something copy of one scheduler. <coughs> so it's already uh, talking about very fast. Scheduler, the searching part over here, my left hand is doing the search, right? It's just take on average, not on the worst case, on average, pick off one time, okay? Just a constant time look up to look for the next guy to run, okay? So, but but people think that it's not good enough, so come come with a completely fair scheduler because uh, you know, uh, scheduler is not always looking at performance, okay? No matter how fast is producer process to run, you have to be fair to all processes. So people prefer the completely fair scheduler, okay? And this guy just this guy just don't like the the war over the the choose of the scheduler, okay? They he create this BFS. Okay. Very interesting, huh? Okay. So before we understand what is a, a scheduling algorithm, okay, so we will look into the mechanism of how a process can switch from one to another, okay? So we all look from the point of view from the CPU, okay? So the CPU depends on uh, what is the mode they are in, okay? So let's imagine that the first step, the mode that the CPU is running is on the user process. Then we switch to kernel, and then switch back to user's process, just back and forth, okay? So the mode I'm talking about is whether you're running user process or the kernel. Okay, so let's start the story. The story is very, very fair and uh, easy to understand. Uh, this process, okay, this guy, sorry, this green guy, this green guy is a container code and it will eventually run sleep one. Okay, so what should you say about sleep one? Sleep one is to, uh, you know, it's calling sleep, right? That means that you go to sleep. But go to sleep is not the trigger, it's actually meaning that you sacrifice your rights to run on the CPU and avoid being selected by the scheduler for let's say sleep one. That is for one second, you avoid from being selected by the scheduler, then after that one second, you come back, okay? So we just focus on the first half of the story. The first half of the story is you sacrifice the CPU rights, okay? You don't want it. So what is the meaning of you don't want it? So the first step is you call sleep. Okay, when you call sleep, what should the kernel knows about it? Sleep is a system call. So it will go down using step two, uh, go down to the kernel space, 
and execute the code for the slip. So what is the meaning of the code of the slip? It is the process in sacrificing your rights, your privilege to run on the CPU because originally you run it. Then you give up the privilege and go to sleep. So this is the process in giving up the privilege. After you successfully do the process, you successfully give up the uh, privilege. So where is the CPU is pointed at? Now it's point to the scheduler. The scheduler should choose an other guy to run. Why? Because we don't want the CPU to be idle for that one particular second. Okay, so you want another guy to run. Now there, in between step two and step three, okay, we have our, we have to uh, do something. Okay, so what is to do something there? It's actually doing some backup of the original data inside the CPU. So what are the original data? The CPU status, okay, uh, including the what is instruction you're running. What the register value? And just like doing a game, okay, you are playing a console game, okay. Before you switch from one game to another, you have to save, right? And you save something on a, on a I don't know, memory card, uh, the internal hard disk or your game console, okay. So it's just like the same thing. When you try to switch from one process to another, the kernel actually help you to back up everything inside the CPU and save it inside the kernel <coughs> space. You just do a copy it, okay? Well, actually, I've gone through those kernels, okay? Those code assembly code, very horrible, okay? So a bunch of assembly code, you back it up, okay? And when it's finished the backup, then it's the time that the scheduler run, right? The scheduler have to find out, yeah, which, which guy to run, okay? After that scheduler knows, let's say, that this guy, this target will be this blue, code, okay, or blue process to run, then what you do is just like you're playing game again, okay, you you load the new game, okay, after you load the new game, you have to load your previous save data to continue your progress. So, yes, we will do another uh, backup, but this is a reverse side. The original backup is in the kernel space, okay? So let's say this blue guy is already running for some time, and you sacrifice the rights to run on CPU may be due to the clock, may be due to your call to sleep, may be hard disk keyboard. So this guy have his backup. So the backup come back and load back into the CPU and then we can boom, resume the execution of this guy without anyone knowing. So this is the mechanism that you always feel and using when you're using Windows, Mac, Linux. You run a bunch of processes, many, many processes together. And this is the process hiding inside your CPU. It's keep on a backup CPU process, uh, CPU status, put in the kernel, load the new guy, okay? And after you're loading the new guy and restart your original, uh, maybe not original, I don't know when, but you pause for some time, resume, and after you resume running and then pause for some time, resume another process and doing it continuously. If you have one core, then you can do it in parallel for one process. If you have two cores, okay, then you have this uh, flow doing in parallel for two instances, okay? So that's why in our Linux, okay, I don't know whether I've shown you before, there is a file uh, usually is to keep track on how many CPU you have. Okay, so the file oh, sorry is too too up there. Okay, so you can also find this file uh, in your virtual box environment. Uh, the frost file system I already told you this about the kernel data structure. The kernel export their data to you, and when you do a cat, that means that you read the content. So what can you see inside this? Okay, so it's a bunch of things. Okay. So at least telling you what is the model of your CPU, okay? And this is not very important. The more important is, it tells you how many processors you have, okay? So you have uh, this uh, command I call cat. The processor zero, that means it's not about you have zero processor, okay? This is a in array index, zero, the first processor. Okay, if you have more processor, you will have one, zero, one, two, three, four, all the way down, okay? So I can do the following. Let's say I go back to our department, CSD department, hey, what's that? 
I'm on I. What? Yeah, see, usually CSG stuff a little bit weird. Okay, no problem. Uh, I use VPN. Okay, wait. Okay, good. So let's go back to my uh, my office PC. Okay, this is a process. I uh, know oh this is SSH, and I go to my PC in my office. I oh no, let's talk about T Y one. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at my office PC. CPU info. Okay. So let's look up a bit. So what can you say? This is the last ID of the processor. Actually, we have four. Zero, one, two, three, so four. So that means that uh, this scheduler, okay, or this kernel on my on my uh, PC have to do this switching in four instances, okay? For CPU zero, it had this process going on. CPU one, CPU two, CPU three, and keep on loading and offloading one process and loading another one uh, very frequently, okay? So actually, the, the kernel at the CPU is very busy uh, because the clock interrupt, the clock interrupt I talked about here, okay, it's very frequent, okay? Keep on, keep on uh, telling the, that yeah, do you want to do something? Yeah, do you want to do something? Uh, I remember the frequency is per second 100 times. Okay, 100 times asking the CPU, that, yeah, what do, you, what, what, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Keep on asking. Okay, very annoying. Okay. So, but based on this annoying process, okay, we have this kind of interactive implementation of our system. Okay? So, and why, why don't move? Okay. So, uh, one more thing, okay? Uh, why I have to tell you about this context switching? It's not because of uh, anything interesting there. It's just a necessity. You have to know, actually, this context switching may cause time, right? You have to load memory from CPU to kernel space memory and then load back and forth in incurred time. And other possibility is, if you remember this diagram, it is uh, more than one month ago, okay, we talked about, uh, what is that? The our memory architecture, uh, there is a possibility that the process that the scheduler want to run, there are some memory hiding inside the hard disk. Okay? So this expensive IO swap, okay, I call it IO swap, input output swap, okay? It's very expensive. Expensive means time consuming. Okay? So basically the concentration is a good good thing, okay? So what the scheduler can do, the scheduler can cannot say that, oh you are a bad user, okay? Why you ask me to run process T? Let me kill it, okay? <laughs> yeah, scheduler cannot do it, okay? Now, scheduler, what can they do for the best uh, effort? The best effort they can do is, let's say you have a bunch of processes ready to run. Uh, let's say it's ABC guy. ABC guys usually love to run on process ID maybe free, okay? Then you will keep on running there. Why is that? Okay, and this depends on how good you know about the memory architecture. Okay, so how many of you know about this kind of thing? Uh, so it's called L1 cache. Cache. Okay, so multi level caches. Okay, we have a level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4. Okay, so here. How many of you have heard of this? Or you. you you never heard of a number more than L2. Yeah, then now we have L3, okay? So, uh, do you know what is the special about, so special about L1? L1 is the fastest, it's highlighted here. Uh, before, uh, more than fastest, do you have any idea over this L1 cache? Smallest. Hmm? Smallest. Small? Small, yeah, very small. Very fast, very small. And any other idea over this L1 cache? No one else. Okay, so M1 cache is actually have a very special property. Of course, it's best closest to the CPU. Plus one more thing, because of the design, they want to be closest to the CPU. Every core have one. Okay, every CPU core have one L1, and for L2, they share share among all cores within one CPU and L3 as well. Okay, so well L1 
since it is a uh, per core, have that amount of memory, so the scheduler have to adopt to it. They don't want to, let's say that, oh, I won't want to flow up, uh, we, we got to catch uh, flush or dirt, make it dirty, want to flush it out, okay? We don't want to, uh, we load all the caches. So the scheduler may adopt to this practice. Later on, I will mention this. Okay. Of course, uh, for this guy, we cannot avoid, okay? We, we have to pay the penalty when you schedule another guy. Okay. So it requires don't response. All right, so let's talk about some basics over the scheduler, okay? The scheduler has an algorithm, okay? So before we talk about the algorithm, most of the modern operating system will classify processes into two types. So what is uh, two type of processes? We have the I/O bound processes. We have the CPU bound processes. So what are they? CPU bound processes is a very um, nowadays is very rare, okay? Because most of the CPU uh, CPU sucking monster, I usually usually love to talk it. Talk about like this, okay? Now have a way to off offload to GPU. We have a way to uh, do other offloading. Let's consider we don't have any GPU, okay? Then let's say you have you want to do uh, let's say uh, uh, machine learning, graph searching, or other algorithm that you have learned in a data structure. At this data structure course, go okay. The data structure courses. Now remember what you have done in the data structure course. Okay, so your assignment is essentially about like this. You are given a file, you load the file into the memory, then let's say the example is do a graph searching, okay? Uh not graph searching means pairwise on this path, okay? So you run the pairwise on this path algorithm. Now during the time the algorithm is running, usually you're working over memory. Yeah, think about it. What you're doing? You're doing some for loop, okay? The size plus algorithm for I, the proper IJK, okay? Very easy to understand. Uh, this one is called Dice Plus D, okay? Yeah, you, you remember that you Google, okay? Then you say DIJK something is Dice's name, okay? And the for loop is IJK also, okay? So, yeah. No, this is all about memory, right? Memory, running code of your design, of your command, but not running for now, okay? You won't be so stupid that during the dice rush is running, you post pin up there. Okay? Yeah, it's stupid, okay? So you're not doing that. And after you're doing the sorting, the dice rush algorithm, or whatever algorithm you're talking about in data structure course, then you will load the memory back to somewhere. Let's say you print the screen, having the results, or you write your data back to the output file. Alright? Now, this is a good process. When you start this assignment, you have a what we call IO bound process. Okay, the process becomes IO bound. What you are doing is actively assessing your hard disk without any useful code that is written by you, right? You are just telling the uh, processor to yeah load something onto my array, uh, 2D, 3D, I don't know what is D, okay? But yeah, load it. After you finish loading, then you will switch to CPU bound processes. Okay, you do sorting, uh, add dice rock and n cube algorithm, okay? Yeah, very slow, huh? Maybe a sorting, sorting is n of n, okay, faster. But still, you are all over, running over memory, as well as CPU. So never touch any I.O. Okay, usually it's not, okay, you can do it, but, but your process will be very slow. Then after doing the CPU process, you switch back to I.O. bound, because you want to write all the data from the memory into the screen or onto a file, okay? So why I have to classify this? Now let's consider from the CPU running. Uh, what is IO bound process now? IO bound is this guy, okay? IO bound is the time that you spend on system is more than the time you spend on user. So that means you're running kernel code more than running user code. Why is that? Let's say you're doing this for loop, uh, the for loop is to scan, scan something onto where? The memory. So the scanning part usually takes more time, okay? Now, how about here? The classification is user time back at the system time. So you're doing sorting. All things are already inside <coughs> the memory. You have a n square array, okay, or just a linear array. I don't care, 1 million, 10 million items. You do the sorting. 
you do the graph searching, you never touch I.O., so you never have system call. That's why user time is bigger than system time, okay? So the design of the scheduler is usually favor this guy. Usually favor this guy. It's never favor this guy, because why? Because different IOs have different running time. I mean, running time means waiting time, okay? The running time will be long, will be short, depends on what the device you're using. And the scheduler cannot cope with this. But the scheduler can control for how frequent your user code go on to the CPU to run. Because you don't have to wait, because you're using running, using all the, all the code that you've written, but you never touch the kernel. Okay, so this is a easy to to predict. This is a harder to predict. So all the scheduling algorithm favor this guy. Okay, so later on when you see different classification, basically they just restrict these guys. They never restrict these guys because let's say how come I can restrict the LS? Yeah, you find that oh the LS is too slow. Okay, let's make it faster. Can you do it? Usually it's not right because you want to make it faster. You are the scheduler. How can you make it faster? Okay, you overclock the CPU suddenly? No, you cannot. Okay, you can only give more chance for this LS program to go on the CPU, but can you? You know it's not. Because it depends on how slow the hard disk responds. The hard disk gives you more, then you can display more. But the hard disk did not give you anything. No matter how, how frequent you put it in the CPU, this just refuse to give you answer. Okay? So you cannot speed up LS, you cannot speed up networking, right? Well, if that is that's good, yeah, I said that you can speed up networking, yeah, from, from 1 GB to 10, 1 TB, okay? Very good, no, this cannot. So, this is something that you can boost, this is something that you cannot boost. The boosting means that let's say you're running a deep learning program, okay, usually it's involved loops, okay? You can speed it up by suppressing other processes. Right? You have one one thousand process running. I have a very important process. I can boost its priority to have a more frequent chance to get on the CPU so that compared to the same system running and under configuration, you will have a shorter time in running. So this is what I call boosting the performance of this kind of CPU browsers, but you cannot boost this guy. Okay, so scheduler is talking about how to make things fast or slow based on your criteria okay so this figure is just an illustration so the 3d online game is a perfect demonstration of how a process can have a multiple uh, I some supports of system that behave differently we will have a support let's say that you're calculating strategy AI process okay then it will receive you bound or maybe there is a under subsystem waiting for the input from your components. Okay, you're playing LOL, okay? There's many components, okay? Or maybe LOL is not big enough, okay? Uh, AOE, okay, AOC, yeah, there's many, many things flying around, you can play uh, eight players, okay? So you have to wait for the remaining seven players to give you responses. And also, one more, you have to draw all the horses, uh, all, the, all the soldier, okay? That involve both, okay? Because you have to display that, before you have to display that, you have to calculate their exact position so that uh, you won't be cheated by the screen. Uh, the screen will say that there is a horse, okay, I want to kill it. That doesn't jump, okay? Yeah, you have to do it uh, in parallel with these two remaining guys, okay? So that's why this guy will be a max, okay? So as I've told you, we cannot penalize, uh, or shouldn't penalize, but uh, do an unfair job over the IO bound because this guy already get his own penalty, you wait for something that is your penalty, okay? But we can always penalize this guy, or this guy, okay? Because it's an I, a CPU bound. All right, so let's focus as a more low-level point of view, okay? So what's a more low-level point of view? The low-level point of view is about the scheduling process. I'm not scheduling process, it's a scheduler. When you want to schedule, okay, basically what are the, what was that? What are the exact uh, time that you will find that I will schedule another process? Okay, when a process, new process is created, of <laughs> course it's the best time to schedule another process. Why? You have one more, 
on the side of all set of ready process. You change the queue. You submit one more guy to the queue. So you will have the best moment of time to choose. Okay, maybe the scheduler can hard code. Let's say you just call for okay. <laughs> You want to consult the you your system call, okay? You create you finish calling the fog. You want to consult the scheduler. Hey, what should we do? Should we do a fair schedule again? Uh, to put all the guys together, including a new child, or you do hard code. Hard code is that oh, when I consult it, you always tell me that yeah, you don't have to worry. Keep on running the uh, parent. Or the hard code is no, I don't want to run the parent. Let's give the young guy some chance, okay? Uh, give the child to run. This already based on the uh, implementation of the scheduler, okay? Of course, scheduler is fair, then do another processing over the queue, but it will walk time, okay? So some scheduler have to hard code. Next is the uh, excess of the <coughs> existing process, okay? Of course, I have to tell you that uh, when it says uh, you don't have to run anymore, so better sacrifice your CPU priority, uh, privilege, I should say. Uh, wait for I.O., okay, including the time, okay, the clock, the hard disk, the keyboard, or finishing I.O., okay? So the handling routines of a hardware usually will also consult the scheduler. Hey, I've just handled a request from the hard disk. The hard disk tell me that, yeah, it's finished delivering me six megabytes of data. What should I do, okay? I do mean that, uh, should I pick another process to run? Keep on the old original process, or pick the one that need the data. Okay, so it's all <coughs> can be hard code or doing a fair schedule again. All right. So there are two kinds of scheduler. Uh, this is a very old scheduler which never exists anymore. Uh, it exists only in the 1970s and early 60s. So one day we have a name here called non-preemptive scheduler or non-preemptive scheduler. So what is preemptive? Preemptive means that uh, you can imagine this case that you are in the home, okay? While you're playing game, your mom tells you to eat dinner. So usually you are in a non-preemptive mode. No one can interrupt you, okay? So that is called non-preemptive, okay? No matter how, how big the interrupt is, okay? Your, your mother already wants to pull the power plug. Okay, this is a very important uh, Interrupt, okay, it's shut down process already, okay. But then yeah, forget about this. Yeah, someone knocked on the door, okay. So you ignore it. You ignore it. There's a non preemptive scheduler, okay. So what is a non preemptive scheduler? It's usually based on <coughs> the design that you don't want to be stopped running by another process introduced to the system, okay. So you can uh, never find it anymore, okay, because you cannot find it, let's say, the uh, I just exit this, oh no, exit is not a good case, okay? Maybe I wait for I.O., okay? I wait for I.O., then I sacrifice the process, the processor, the CPU, and other process step in, and that means that I am the old process, I don't have any chance to go back because I cannot interrupt it back, okay? I cannot say that, oh, please, give me some, some CPU time, I just need two more milliseconds and I have finished, okay? But no, it's not preemptive, okay? So this is not a, good scheduler, but we use many, many years, uh, even in our you know, our school, okay? I, I know that uh, because uh, there is a, was a very old professor, he's already retired, tell, tell us a story in the class as well, okay? Talking about, yeah, the punch card story, you may have heard of it. Uh, his story is talking about scheduler. The scheduler is, uh, if you want to run this pre non-preemptive job, okay, usually you have to tell, uh, by that time there the IDSC as well, <laughs> Okay, have ideas that I have this punch card, okay? I want to run it non preemptively for five hours. I guarantee you that after five hours my process will end. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is by human to control for a, a process to run for how long. Okay? And other is is reverse, okay? It's opposite. Preemptive scheduling. Okay, let me highlight it. Okay? Preemptive scheduling means that the previously, I talk about all the events, except the I.O. weights, uh, the timer, okay, all will be enabled so that you can stop the process from running, okay? So this is the mode that uh, your girlfriend or boyfriend talk to you, okay? Whenever it brings from you, you have to handle it, okay? If you don't handle it, you will have a big trouble, okay? You, you can imagine the case, okay? Yeah. 
So this is the, the reverse. I don't need uh, too much time to talk about it. All right. So uh, some common goals for a scheduler. So usually three common goals. Fairness, very important, right? You don't expect that uh, I submit a job to your share, share server will gain a particular higher share than yours. You should expect that, let's say we run the same program, same input for the same time, then we should approximately use the amount of time. Let's say you run for many, many minute. I also run for many minute, but I'm not running faster than you. Why I can run faster than you? Because during that one minute, you are not actually holding the CPU for all the time. There are times that the scheduler push, push another guy to the CPU. The scheduler choose another one. So that one minute you did not cease, you did not get the whole CPU. So that's why usually I say that your process runs for one minute, actually it can be shorter. By what? By controlling the scheduler. The scheduler say that, okay, this time I give you a higher priority, so you will eliminate your opponents during, during that time. You can shorten it by pull out guys who share the CPU with you. So the Fairness means that if we want for the same process, same amount of input, you should get the same results by the same time. This is the fairness. Okay? It doesn't mean that I'm user A, you are user B, you are given the time for one minute, and I'm also given one, one minute. This is not fair because we and maybe I don't want any job, okay, but I forced you to idle for another one minute. It's not fair, okay? So it's based on processes, it's not based on user. And the reverse of it is actually based on user. Based on user, what is the meaning? The meaning is usually there are some important process, important process in the system run by the root or the administrator, right? The administrator running jobs must be more important than yours, okay? So the administrator have the rights to increase their process privilege. Like what the process, the process maybe is about uh, uh, shutting down some naughty processes, okay? I need to create a process to shut down another process, okay? But if I cannot create that process, then I have a trouble, okay? So the, 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 the killer process, huh? So the killer process have to get a very high priority, okay? So it's about policy enforcement, okay? So it's about normal user versus administrator. One more, this is very hard. I'm sorry, this is very hard. What is very hard is balance between CPU and I.O. Okay, so you are a mixed type of process. You have sometimes spending on I.O., sometimes spending on CPU. Now this is very hard to make a balance, okay? So what can I say about this feature? The feature is we want to push everything to limit so that we don't keep any part of the system idle for too long. Let's say your process are running some uh, hard disk request first, okay? Then you have to sacrifice the CPU privilege to let our process to run so that I don't keep the CPU idle. Or there is a guy running the CPU, okay? And other than waiting for IO process, I shouldn't say that, okay, the hard disk finished data process is now. I keep the hard disk waiting. Yeah, wait, 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 I have process run, okay? I let this guy running and then I pick that data up. Usually it's not, it's running in parallel. So that I can let the hard disk run as fast as possible. Okay, so uh, just one small question. Anybody have heard of the name called DMA? Minor students should have, right? Minor, stu minor students should have. Then it's, what's the cost name? 2510, right? DMA, no? Okay. So what, what have, where have you heard of DMA? Microprocessor course, REG. I, I, I RG course, okay? So for us, uh, no? So you are from IG, but you are also from the same course. Uh, I heard about uh, DMA. No, I know something about the MSP. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the problem, okay? So why I mentioned the keyword DMA, okay? DMA, what is the name? What is the purpose of DMA? I should say, maybe it's not important. What is the purpose? Uh, maybe to uh, trans, uh, transport. Yeah, yeah, tra transfer, transport, what? Data. Data from where to where? Uh, from memory to memory. 
yeah, to hot, uh, to devise the memory. Okay. So uh, why I mentioned this keyword? This keyword is very important actually. It is a mechanism in our motherboard. It's already there for many years. Okay, to allow a hard disk, a GPU, or another uh, data first T monster. Okay, they have lots of data exchange from the memory to the device. When they are doing the exchanges, okay, they don't need a CPU to monitor the process. Okay, they don't need a CPU to monitor. Oh, you finish the first block. Okay, you have to shift the next block. No, we don't need it. Okay, there is a automatic control down there. Okay, so this is the control in imposing this balance. Okay, so this is all done in hardware perspective. Okay, so actually this goes a very contradicting thing. Okay, so when you want to have fairness, you won't have policy enforcement. Okay, you have policy enforcement, then you don't have this balance. Okay, so now our course will be only focused in the fairness first. Okay, so uh, before that, uh, I have to finish one more slide before we stop. The slide is talking about what is uh, scheduling out. What is that? Okay. So for a scheduling algorithm, we have two types. One type is called online algorithm. Another type is called offline algorithm. Okay. So what is this? This doesn't mean that I plug the wire. It's called online algorithm. and remove the wire. It's not offline. No, no. Okay. Online algorithm is our air, our engineering building elevator scheduler. You cannot predict what to come next. Okay, you can only adopt to the new environment and make a choice in scheduling. So that's why that online scheduling algorithm in our SHP sucks. Really bad, okay? I always say that its, it's goal is to maximize our inconvenience. Okay, yeah, it's, it's true. Huh? So this is online algorithm. Offline algorithm is reverse. You have a setting already. You have to set up uh, when the process will come, how many people come in the elevator, so and so forth. It's already set. It's called online offline algorithm. If it's offline, then we can look for optimal scheduling ways in order to minimize something. It depends on the goals we, we want to minimize. Okay. So another kind of uh, inputs. Okay. So inputs will be a set of tasks. There for each task, they have an arrival time when it will come to the system. I mean, the come to system means that you type a keyboard and press the enter. There's a time. Okay, CPU requirement. So what's the meaning of CPU requirement? The time that you need to run before you stop. Okay. Uh, so if if you are from a CS department, then you will understand that this. Uh, sorry, I cannot highlight it. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why is that? Okay. So this CPU requirement is a false. Uh, really, really force claim. Okay, it's a lousy requirement. So why is that? Uh, in a course in CS department about theory, it's a theory course. It's called uh, formal languages and algorithm. Uh, is there is a theory talking about you cannot determine when a process to stop. Yeah, there is a proof. Okay, to prove the proof that you cannot prove a, the top stopping time of a process. Yeah, that's theory. Okay, so we're really talking about this. So that means that you don't know the CPU requirement actually. Okay, but more all the books are talking about this. I will translate this into another thing. It is not the CPU requirement, but the time after the, the time is up, the process will be killed by the kernel. Let's say we trans translate it into another thing. Okay, so it's not the CPU requirement, but after getting the CPU source resource for that amount of time. You will be killed. Okay, so let's assume to be like this. All right. So what is the output? <coughs> the output will be the scheduling order. So what should this uh, process be scheduled? Uh, what is the individual turn and run time? Individual running time. So what is the turn and run time and the uh, running time? So the turn and run time is this. You submit a job to the job mean the process to the system. Until when? Until the time that the process is finished, the total time will be turned around time. Okay. So what is the waiting time? Uh, waiting time. The waiting time will be the time you wait for the CPU service. 
Okay, so how do I translate this? Okay, I always have a very perfect uh, scenario. Park and shop. Okay, so uh, I think most of you are living in the dormitory. Then, then, you, then you understand what I mean. Okay, by the time of six o'clock to six half past six every night, park and shop is just like crazy. Okay, there's more people in there. Okay, so you imagine the time you need to spend. Okay, is the time that you enter the shop and go off the shop. Okay. Let's say there is a friend waiting for you outside. Okay, you go into the shop and I'm out of the shop, and that is the time that we call the turnaround time. Really turn around, right? Turn there around, go out. Okay. And another time is waiting time, right? What's the waiting time? It's the time that yeah, you're shopping doesn't doesn't incur any waiting time because you're happy, right? You're doing something. I'm very happy, very happy. Okay? Putting things in the basket, in the car. Okay. Then what's the waiting time? The waiting time is the time you wait on on that queue before you get service. Okay, you actually understand, okay? While you're waiting for a service, you're very unhappy. But when you're being served, no matter how long, you won't feel unhappy. Right? Yeah, just think about it. You're waiting for why they're smoking so slow, okay? Then when you're being served, yeah, slowly, don't worry, okay? Yeah, it's like that. Uh, so that means the waiting time is a measurement of how unhappy you are, okay? Turnaround time is the one standing outside watching you. And that guy is very unhappy. It's also it's measuring the guy standing outside. Waiting time is the guy that is you. Okay? Waiting for service. Okay? So this is the two time that we will measure. And next we will talk about all this algorithm. Uh, where this set of algorithm, FIFO, certain soft first, uh, round robin. Round robin is the uh, modern operating system favorite uh, scheduling algorithm, priority scheduling. And multi queue priority scheduling. Multi queue is a real implementation, means that we have different rules of scheduling, and each rule builds a queue. Okay? So actually, we have multiple queues point to the same CPU, and the CPU pick the queue, which queue to run, and within which queue, there is a special uh, implementation of the scheduling algorithm. Okay? So we will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, I hope that I can finish. Order algorithm. Okay. Thank you.